I'm very glad to be back here. And I will keep the opening remarks very short to get to jump directly into the presentation. And I couldn't have a better introduction than your presentation, like the last part, I would say, uh, which was really talking about the issues that we uh, have to think about in the future as architects. I'm not an architect, I'm an architecture historian, but I'm trying like as a curator, as Marcus pointed out, to make the audience aware, our public audience in the museum aware of what architects do and also to engage the architecture community into the arguments that I think have to um, have a wider, wider impact in the future. So my lecture is basically addressing three or four questions. First, I want to go into the, uh, into the main question, what is the social relevance of architecture by today? What, then secondly, what can architects do in, this, in confronting this question? Third, what are the lessons that we can take from the ground? So what's really happening in that area of interest? And as the last part of the uh, lecture, I want to talk about the next steps. So where are we going to? And first, uh, the question, what is the social relevance? And I think we have all seen a lot of images of iconic buildings all over the world. Iconic buildings that are published in magazines that you know very well. And this was a kind of a random choice of our technical university's library from a, uh, like an average month when you look into it. And what you see is, uh, I think, very shocking for me. If you look on all these magazines, you see not a single human being on these magazines. So wh for, for whom are these buildings built for? Uh, what is the, the relevance of these buildings? If we confront this image or these images that are constantly repeated in the magazines, in the public magazines, in all the magazines, with the other images of the other reality of this world. And I mean, we saw some of the statistics that Nane brought up, what is uh, happening in China, what's happening in other countries, and uh, these kind of developments where I would say architects are not involved, but maybe they should be involved. You may search around in these favelas in Caracas for long to find uh, an architecture office here, but uh, you will not be surprised by the numbers that you all have read about, that the urban growth is exactly happening there where these informal settlements are happening. And they're happening in increasing numbers. So the formally designed uh, habitations, the, the office towers, the uh, apartment buildings that we see all over in the magazines and so on, they're not reflecting the the reality of what's happening in the built environment. And this is just looking on the continent of Africa. That's a continent where I'm doing a lot of research in the last years now, because I want to understand what is really the future of architecture, architecture as a profession in, in that continent that has the lowest uh, percentage of architecture schools, uh, but the highest uh, like um, growth of economy uh, worldwide in the moment. So for me, uh, I want to point on this basic question, like this is a provocation on the beginning. Uh, what is the role of architects by today? Is it really the role as designers for these luxury brands, for these luxury goods that are standing in the, uh, like in this, civilized uh, magazines as, as the, the, the icons of tomorrow? Or is there anything that architects can do? And I think Nane pointed on the right direction with his, the last part of his, his uh, lecture, that the research is one part, and the other part is the, really, uh, the impact that you give by designing, by really doing something in the reality of these social 
uh, uh, of these neighborhoods or these areas that we we are looking at. So, just a short look back into history. I don't want to go into that I into detail because I could give a full lecture on the history of social architecture, socially engaged architecture in the 20th century, but I just want to point out with this footnote that the second meeting of the International Committee of uh, Council of Architecture uh, uh, was uh, uh, in Frankfurt addressing uh, the question of die Wohnung für das Existenzminimum, so the lowest income housing. And it was the stars of that time, the star architects of that time, like Le Corbusier and Gropius and all of them, uh, meeting in Frankfurt to think about the, the low income uh, housing and I'm I'm really looking around in Germany at the moment and while we have the crisis of refugees and I don't see in any architecture school in Germany at the moment a really a strong reaction to what's really happening with the situation and I think this is this is the moment where there should be a, a different attitude towards architecture also beyond uh, the schools also in politics and I was my personal interest started with the exhibition in 2002, I think it was at the Venice Biennale in, uh, Ven uh, in Venice when Massimiliano Fuxas was the chief curator and he took the provocative title Less Aesthetics, More Ethics, which made me really angry at that moment because I said, why do you separate e ethics from aesthetics? This, is, this cannot be the right thesis. It has to be more aesthetics and more ethics. And I want to explain you why, because we will show, I will show you some of the examples that I visited and that I ex uh, posed and I presented in some of the exhibitions in recent years. And I think this is where I want to go also uh, forward with some more exhibitions in the future. So when I uh, worked at the Museum of Modern Art from 2007 to 2010. Uh, the first question to me was, what would be my first exhibition? And in an institution like MoMA that has institutionalized architecture presentations from 1920, uh, 1932 with the International Style Exhibition by Philip Johnson, and then again and again was uh, like the institution that was giving styles out to the world as a rule, uh, I wanted to find out what can I do as a curator in this institution, this powerhouse of thoughts of uh, impact uh, to maybe to change a little bit the public perception of uh, architecture in, in a broader sense. So I started researching with some of the projects that I had known before and uh, trying to find out more what can the impact uh, of architecture nowadays be. And this is just as a short overview. Uh, these were 12 projects and I will point, I will go into details in two or three of them in the following uh, part of the lecture. So with this show, I started um, to try what would the public reaction be. And the first reaction in the museum was very skeptical. But fortunately, it was uh, the year 2008 when I proposed this exhibition to the exhibition committee. And uh, with the crisis in America, this question of the socially uh, engaged architecture became sort of something that uh, the MoMA was also getting some uh, finding some interest. So I want to uh, show two or three examples from that exhibition and also from other exhibitions that I've uh, presented, uh, not only at MoMA but also in other institutions. And since 2013 I'm working in Munich and I'm trying to continue my research, research by exhibiting with other projects as well. So first project is the, uh, the design or the school project by Francis Quere, which was also on the poster that you've seen here in the lobby. If not, the superintendent here of the building has removed the, all the posters uh, again and again. So uh, Francis Quere was born in uh, Gando, which is a village that you see here from an aerial view. 
in Burkina Faso. And if you don't know where Burkina Faso is, I didn't know it before 2008, before I started my research for the exhibition. It's one of these landlocked uh, sub-Saharan countries, one of the poorest countries in the world. Average income is $1 per day and the illiteracy rate is around 80 percent. So there's no gold, there's no oil, there's nothing that anybody would be interested in, so this country stays poor as it is. And Francis was born exactly in this little uh, savannah village, and when I visited it, I took my own pictures to just to make sure it is really what I see in the publications. And uh, for a long to make a very long story very short, Francis was born there and found through some very happy circumstances his way to study architecture in Berlin at the Technical University in Berlin. And while he was in Berlin, as a student of architecture, he uh, always gained some money by driving taxi or doing other things and sent the money to his family in Gando in Burkina Faso. And at a certain moment, his uh, classmates from the university, they said, uh, you should not send money to your, to your family in Burkina. You should give them something back as an architect. Why, why are you sending money? So Francis changed his mind, uh, stopped sending the money, which created a crisis within his family, as you can imagine and started to collect the money that uh, he could uh, get also from lecturing and other things to build a school. He said, I gained my education through school, so I should pay back my community with a school. So the first crisis was when he stopped uh, with, paying, uh, with giving the money. And the second crisis came when he had the money and came back to his community and said, now we're going to build a school and we build it with clay bricks. And the family said, you, are you crazy? You studied architecture in Berlin and now you come up with clay, with uh, clay bricks? This is the most primitive technology and did you study that in Berlin? And he said, no, we, I'm not coming with steel and glass and concrete because we have, don't have the energy here. We cannot, we cannot use it and you cannot maintain it. So we should use the material that is really uh, local, locally available that you can maintain. And I mean, it was a, a, a great opportunity that he could really build that school that you see here, uh, because he was also the eldest son of this, this tribe. So he was, had a certain power in his, in his family to get this uh, process through. This project was built within the whole community. Everybody was bringing in the bricks, uh, fabricating and uh, helping with that. There's no big machinery. This was all built by hand. There was no electrical power used, it's all built by hand. And with this school, Francis Carré won the Aga Khan Award of Architecture. Aga Khan is rewarding the architecture since 1980 uh, for ecological and social purposes. And it's the first award worldwide and it's, a, it's an award uh, by one million dollars. So I don't know why nobody in Europe knows about, uh, m so much about the Aga Khan Award, because it's much higher than the Pritzker Prize, and it has been socially engaged since 1980, which the Pritzker Prize is, I think, still not really thinking about. So Francis took a part of that money then. He brought his father, the ch chief of the tribe, to the award ceremony and then they reported back and he took a part of the money and created then a school extension because already when the school was finished they had three times more children to apply for that school that they could take into the three classrooms. So just to show you li uh, literally how I observed that how they made the bricks, so with hand, uh, with muscular power, and this is how it looks like. Very simple, very easy construction, no air condition needed, uh, natural lighting. Uh, it's, it's really a, a school that has attracted the best schools of the country now, uh, the best teachers, sorry, the best teachers from the country want to teach in that school, and this has the impact that the children have the best grades were like in that all this area uh, in all the schools there. So architecture made a really a big impact. So the second step was building another school extension. Uh, and in, on the lower part, you see the houses for the teachers. 
and it goes on. Uh, the library was built uh, last year and it will be finished by this year and a women's uh, center so to educate the the women the women are taking 80 percent of the responsibility for the children and also for education and for the 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 health of the families so ch the women will also get uh, education in the future so as you see on this map there is already like now uh, kind of um, a, a, an impact from like from the school, from the teacher's housing, from the extension of the school to the library, to the women's center now. Uh, so one architect is now rebuilding uh, the perception of architecture in a, in a country. And now he is getting, Francis is getting the request by the Ministry of Education in Burkina Faso, in Ouagadougou, to build a high school now. Because now, the educational minister says, so where are we going with all these well-educated children now? So now we need a high school. And so this is going on. I think this is just one example how architects can change uh, in, a, in a clear, like with a clear uh, thought of uh, analysis and reacting on the ground what they can do. And just one more uh, sentence on that project. Uh, it's about the impact of the exhibition. I showed this project in Munich in the exhibition of architecture and uh, there was a lady uh, or a family from Munich uh, who were engaged in social funding in Africa for a long time. They saw the project in Munich in the show and here you see Francis Guerre and here you see the lady from Munich. So they decided uh, to build another school in Bamako, also in, uh, in Burkina Faso, on their private money. And I found out only like uh, uh, um, a year later when Francis told me about that school that was almost finished. And this is the picture of this uh, March. So I will go for the opening in January. Uh, so the exhibition had the impact to give other people, to make other people think about uh, really working with Francis on another school. So this was a very specific case, I know, because Francis was born there, studied in, in Germany and brought his uh, kind of knowledge back in a, in a transformed way to his home village. I think this is something that cannot be repeated easily, but I want to show you like with another example that there are other ways of uh, like sort of changing changing societies or changing neighborhoods with, through architecture. The second example is in Rwanda. As you might know, in uh, 1994, there was the genocide in Rwanda, Hutu and Tutsi were uh, the, the big massacre. One million people died in less than 10 months. It was one of the greatest failure of United Nations and Kofi Annan admitted that recently, that they could, uh, could have stopped that massacre, but they didn't. And after that 1994 massacre, there was a, like a long period of uh, reconciliation and very difficult situation. But the women that had uh, been stayed alone and had no education were still like suffering for a long time and for very long until uh, like uh, like now. And there's an in there's an institution called Women for Women. Uh, they were grouped together after the 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 Yugoslavian war uh, and they were trying also to help the the women in Yugoslavia ex Yugoslavia to survive and to get education and this institution is very strong they built all over the world uh, institutions for women to empower the women and this is a um, a specific um, project for Rwanda where they identified in an area that I also visited uh, um, some uh, group of women were exploited in the agri agriculture because they had no education and they were paid very low. So they said, let's build an educational center for these women in agriculture that they build, can start their own business, that they can start their own market, that they know better uh, how to, to grow the, uh, the, the crop and everything else, and also that they might learn in smaller groups uh, reading, writing, math, so that they can manage also their business better in the, uh, in the future. So here, the architect 
came from uh, America, Sharon Davis, and she had never worked before in Africa, but she took a very careful uh, time, a long time to research with the women what was needed with the community around, and she found out that the best material to work with was also the clay bricks, but in this case it was fired bricks that they made themselves. And I show you in a while, like this is just how it looked like uh, three weeks before the opening. And this is the factory that Sharon Davis built with the women to build, uh, to make the bricks. You see here, this is like my assistant here uh, looking at one of the bricks and this is how they fire the bricks. And um, not to be, uh, like just to show you, uh, when I was there, it was three weeks before the opening, and it's 90% of women were really on uh, on the construction, really doing it. They were firing the bricks, they were working with the bricks, they were constructing it, and I saw only two or three men on the on the construction site that were welding together some of the uh, the steel elements. And now, after the 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 project was was finished. Uh, the women started with the teaching with the classes, they invited other women, they're getting now education and they started with a market uh, where they sell their goods and the, uh, the interest is to make this self-sustainable in within five years and then women for women will stop paying like uh, subsidies for that institution. And I think that's a very interesting part, an interesting idea where the architecture plays a great role. So. To change from Africa, which is a passion of mine, I must admit, uh, to other to other areas of interest of my research, uh, there's Alejandro Aravena, which you know now from his appointment to the to being the next curator, chief curator of the Venice Biennale. When I worked with him in 2008, 2009 for the show in uh, in New York at MoMA, he was just uh, like finishing his Quinta Monroy housing in Iquique in Chile and you might have seen him uh, once, he's a very charismatic uh, person as an architect, he says uh, socially engaged architecture can, uh, makes only sense if the architect is also paid by this uh, kind of design, he says I'm not a uh, uh, like a, a layman, I'm, I'm an architect, I'm highly trained, I need to make money and this is why he founded together with the University of uh, Santiago de Chile and an oil firm this uh, group called uh, Elemental and the idea of Elemental is to make uh, low-cost housing, uh, to make it profitable and the first project was the project of Quinta Monray, where 100 families in, an, in a favela were, had to be convinced that they would move out of their houses. The ground would be cleared and then they would get back into housing that would cost only $5,000, which was a subsidy by, subsidized by the city of Iquique. And as a uh, 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 Alejandro always pointed, points out it was not possible to build a full house for five thousand uh, for five thousand dollars. He said it's only possible to build a half of a house. So he kept the the the, the interstate spaces these spaces open, and what you see here is the houses shortly before the opening. So this is kind of the what you would call a uh, Rohbau, row construction in Germany, which you would never be allowed to uh, give over to the to the users in Germany. But in Iquique, they made an exception because they said in the informal areas there is an informal economy, and people will build out their houses themselves. So you give them a raw construction for five thousand euros or dollars, and they will pay off the credit within a couple of years and then uh, they have a property instead of being illegal which they were before in the in the informal settlement now they have their property and they own their own the, the building so what you see here is a couple of months after the people moved in people started move building out the housing they started to build in like little apartments in the in the interspaces here and then to rent them out for other people making money of it paying off their their debit and so uh, within less than uh, 5 years all the 100 families had paid off their credit now they have ownership now they can go to the banks get loans on their houses and open their businesses because now they have a security which they hadn't before. And I think that was a very smart move by Alejandro to use the system of like the informal economy and to really uh, make stimulate 
people to uh, really build out their houses themselves. I think this is the greatest, I, I think, uh, uh, opposition of what architects nowadays think to be. Like this is, of course, is a is a provocation for every architect who thinks that he can design everything until the the, the balcony and uh, the the curtains and everything. But here it's given over, and so the architect gives back something that the people can decide on themselves. So another example where I just want to come also closer to the issues in, in, in Europe, uh, I think is the issue of uh, the, 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 the policy of, of Lacaton Vassal, which you also might know very well, with their first project in Paris, the starting with the study about Paris and the uh, banlieues with the housing of the 60s and 70s, and uh, the nice a film by Nane before where you saw the housing uh, like exploding and falling down. This is what uh, Lacaton Vassal always showed this film in reverse. They say this is not the solution. They say the solution is taking the, the houses as they are and rebuild them and to make them better and to keep the, the people inside as, so, as long as they are there. And this is the, the tower in Paris, uh, Tour Bois Le Bretre, where they could uh, uh, build it first time, their example. And what you see here is their, their project to build with uh, prefabricated elements, to build a second facade around the house, then tear down the interior uh, old facade and expand all the apartments by 20, 15 to 20%. So the, the, each apartment has about uh, 15 to 20% more space, less heating costs, better insulation, more light and a higher quality. All people stayed, all people who lived in the apartments stayed in their apartments. They only moved internally during their construction. They had not to move out. And this was uh, during the construction. This is the end of their uh, uh, of the story. And you can, when you fly into Paris, you can see it, the tower now next to the to the, 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 the big street uh, when you come from the airport. And it's a high, highly successful because now the people pay the same rent as before. The city of Paris who kept this apartment standing up saved about 30 to 40 percent of the money that they would have to spend taking people out, removing the house, building them new housing. So there was an economic impact a positive impact, there was a social impact and there was also a, a kind of a, a, a high impact on the living quality in these in these apartments and as the example of the tour de bois le bretre was so uh, successful uh, in france they decided to give now uh, lacaton vassal uh, many more projects and this is just the one i found uh, now this is just going to be finished now it's 530 apartments in bordeaux and you see in the back this is the former state and in, in the front you see it's already uh, uh, almost completing so these were just a few um, examples from these exhibitions i've made and the question that always comes up with this is what are the criteria for the selection process so uh, I want to point out that all these projects have a, a social value that has to be proven by the reality. I don't trust, I never trust uh, the, the renderings of architects because they're made on their computers with the help of professionals. I only trust these buildings when I've seen them, when I've talked to the people who live in the buildings and when they have already like some uh, expertise with the buildings and the social value for me is not only on the individuals but it's also of, on communities it's not on the one inhabitant of one building it's about the community and in each of these uh, examples that that I presented you and I will present in other exhibitions there's a strong impact on a on a on a, on a bigger number of, of people not only one family the second, sorry, the second uh, criteria or value, uh, as I like to call it, is the, the value of engagement of the architect. So in these cases that I present, there is not an architect who waits for a competition, who waits for a commission to come in, a, a big investor calling him to build something, but it is an architect who goes out and do, does research and uh, tries to find, a, uh, like, 
answers to what he finds and, and what he what he can see and he stays with the project he stays with the community he sometimes directs the, the participatory process of uh, design of the construction or even later uh, directs the community into new projects I think that's a very strong part of it the responsiveness so how does a project respond to the local uh, to the local conditions and I mean local conditions not only the 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 conditions of uh, the gr the ground or the economy it's also the the cultural traditions the, the social conditions so how does an, uh, a project respond to that and it's a very complex uh, complex question but I think in most of these uh, examples you can see it and the strategic value I think is e extremely important is it an example that can only work on this one location or can it be repeated in other locations can it be a uh, kind of the strategy strategy that's included can it be repeated or can it be multiplied and can it be scaled up in a way and i think that's also very important because most of these socially engaged projects that i've seen in earlier times they are like one and only projects they work only in one place and not in another and the the last and i think the most important uh, aspect is the design value so how are these uh, projects addressing the aesthetic value of a of a community or the aesthetic um, yeah the aesthetic quality of all its parts and um, i have seen that like in the community of burkina faso of francis family the people love these schools and they go there also on saturdays and sundays to meet it's the it's now the place where the communities and where everybody is meeting because they see it's a beautiful designed school and it works in many other places so these are like the maybe the five most uh, important criteria for the selection process so question is now from all these examples that that i've seen that i've visited that i've exposed uh how can i how can i as a uh, as a curator or director of a museum how can i go on so there was the first show uh, where i took the title from was small scale big change and uh, with this you see the the catalog here i had research for more than 30 40 projects but i decided only to present 12 projects in New York because I thought let's make it 12 it's a magic number you can explain things very um, clearly on, on, a, on, a, on a smaller number but with this exhibition um, I found there is more projects that I want to present so I published later a book called moderators of change where I had another 20 projects or 25 projects included it was only a book because it was a time when I had uh, like we had no position in the museum so I published it as a book and then um, the show in New York was very successful so the uh, director of the Frankfurt Architecture Museum Peter Schmal and the director of the Architecture Center Wien Architecture Center Wien and Dietmar Steiner they both asked me if they could have the show of MoMA, uh, this small scale big change, which was not possible because MoMA had already said, no, this is not a traveling exhibition. But me being a free curator, I said, okay, we can do another show for Frankfurt and Vienna. And this was then the show in Frankfurt Architecture Museum called Think Global, Build Social. So I changed the title a little bit, uh, not to uh, get in trouble with the MoMA because they had the, the, the sort of the copyright on the title and the show. So I did it for Frankfurt and Vienna. I did a second show, like I, co I copied my own exhibition in another in another institution. Um, and with this uh, with this publication, which was also very successful uh, with Art Plus, I found there was even more interest uh, coming up in, in the public on, on the subject. So when I started in Munich in 2013, I thought, let's just focus on this subject in Africa. So there was the show Africulture. And uh, here I presented 26 socially engaged projects all over Africa. Uh, from uh, all Sub-Sahara, not not uh, the the northern part of of Africa, and in this 
in this exhibition, we invited then also uh, 13 uh, architects from sub-Saharan countries to Munich for a symposium to discuss these issues, which then resulted in, uh, in future exhibition projects. And after that show closed, uh, the Goethe Institute came up and asked me, would you be willing to make this show a traveling exhibition with the same title? And uh, Frankfurt and Vienna agreed. So I did, an, I did a, another show, which is now uh, on tour. And the first, uh, the first venue was in Cairo, just opening a month ago. And you see this was the picture of the opening in Cairo. We had like a three days opening with series of discussions and lectures and uh, and table round table discussions. And it was a very, very important uh, moment because in Cairo there's a very uh, high interest uh, on these questions. And I think uh, the show will now travel from Cairo to 20 other locations all over the world uh, in two versions. So the uh, Goethe Institute published, uh, like produced two identical versions of the exhibition and it will tour on all over the country and continents now. So for me being a director in, Mu in Munich, I want to also like go on with some more research and uh, sort of uh, with specific questions. And the next show that's coming up uh, is then opening on uh, November 18 uh, is with my dear friends uh, Hubert Klumpner and Alfredo Brillenburg from Urban Think Tank. They worked from Caracas uh, researching on the favelas in Caracas. They started really with the research with projecting the cable car in Caracas and other uh, really interesting projects like the uh, Ginasa Vertical as a a favela project where s the children could get sport facilities in the favelas and with them we are uh, now working on this exhibition which had a preview now in the ETH in Zurich and will open in Munich in uh, November 18 and I hope you will all come for the opening. Thank you very much. <laughs>